Welcome to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. The Pharmacy Leaders Podcast is a member of the Pharmacy Podcast Network with interviews and advice on building your professional network, brand, and a purposeful second income from students, residents, and innovative professionals. Well, welcome everyone to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. My name is Jackie Boyle from The Pharmacy Girl, and today we are so excited to have with us Carrie DeCourt. She is the Deputy Network Director of the Veterans Affairs Desert Pacific Healthcare Network, Vision 22, where she oversees of she oversees eight healthcare systems, operates a $4.8 billion budget, serves 30, 000, over 30,000 staff and over 500,000 veterans across 72 sites in the states of Southern California, Arizona, and New Mexico. So, Carrie, we are so excited to have you on the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. Thank you, Jackie. I appreciate the invitation, and it's a great opportunity to visit with others about leadership in pharmacy and healthcare. So thank you for the opportunity. Well, we're, we're excited to have you. So can you tell us a little bit about your professional trajectory, your journey? How did you, how did you get to where you are? A journey is a very good way of describing it, a pretty unique path, I would think. Um, I applied for pharmacy school and medical school. I couldn't make up my mind at the time, and finally it came down to, I think I'll go with pharmacy because it's a little bit more flexible. When you're a doctor, you're always a doctor no matter where you go, and it's really hard to have a part-time physician job. So in my mind, I was really thinking about a future with um, family and maybe going part-time at some point in time. And so I entered pharmacy school pretty much naive, I would say, to the potential of pharmacy and pharmacy leadership. And and I started my career at the Tucson Medical Center as a pharmacy intern, and it was an incredible experience. And I'm so grateful to Tucson Medical Center for giving me the opportunity to work there while I was in pharmacy school. And and really learn about the potential of being a pharmacist and all the different opportunities and some great mentors there at, at Tucson Medical Center and some not great ones that I learned from as well and, and decided what I would want to do in the future. And it really opened my eyes to clinical pharmacy. So I applied for and was accepted to a clinical pharmacy residency program at the Phoenix VA. And the reason I chose the VA is primarily to serve veterans. It's really a passion of mine. I I like uh, being involved in service to others, especially those who have served our country, and especially those veterans who maybe are down on their luck. Uh, They don't have the social or economic support system, and to help them get back into a state of health so that they can move forward in their lives. Uh, My grandfather was a veteran, and he went to the VA several times when I was in high school. Uh, He passed away when I was a senior in high school, and I've always just really felt drawn to serving veterans. And I was very fortunate. At the time, the Phoenix VA was one of the most competitive residency programs in the nation, and I really enjoyed my time there and had incredible mentors, just some of the most brilliant women I've ever met in pharmacy. And they really encouraged me and uh, if not inspired me to be a little bit more competitive and really go for the gusto when it comes to knowledge and pharmacy. And and so I stayed on there after my residency and I was there for about four years and uh, obtained my board certification pharmacotherapy specialist, which wasn't necessarily something everyone was doing at the time. And I was really uh, really trying to pursue excellence for our veterans. But I did have to tell you, and I just got to be honest, Um, sometimes it can be a little frustrating working for the federal government and I love teaching. So I left the VA and took a position as an assistant professor of pharmacy practice at the uh, Midwestern University here in Glendale, Arizona. And I love teaching. I really enjoyed it, but I really missed the clinical practice of being with the veterans. I had a clinical practice site as a consultant pharmacist at an extended care facility, but really missed my veterans. And so I took a transfer to Salt Lake City VA. And that's one of the things I've been very blessed by working in the VA. We have uh, 140 sites across the nation. Um, that's not including all of our clinics. You start counting up all the clinics, and it's a great opportunity to move across the nation and really network and uh, build your skills. So I was the director of pharmacy education and training and the clinical pharmacy management at uh, the Salt Lake City VA. And that was my first supervisory position. And I'll tell you, that's a lot of on-the-job learning. 
Um, and I really enjoyed my practice there. I worked in the ICU. I covered all of my different pharmacy uh, teams as they were out, but really opened my eyes up to the entire healthcare system. You know, pharmacy is such a small piece of what happens in the healthcare system. And I was involved with the quality management officer and doing some root cause analysis and They put me in a different stretch assignment. Uh, I ran prosthetics department for a little while. And then I completely switched over to administration. So I went 100% administration. And not only 100% administration, but in the uh, VA central office in Washington, D.C. And really learned about what it means to be a, a federal entity and how to work with Office of Congressional Legislative Affairs and um, Office of the Medical Inspector and, and more integration with Joint Commission and a variety of processes up at the central office level. But again, there I was missing my veterans. I really love being around the veteran patients. You know, they can just make me smile and they remind me of why I work as hard as I do. So I took a downgrade to come back out to the field and I was in Tucson for about four years and again went back up into administration. I was the assistant director there for a little while and then I transferred over to Los Angeles where I was the associate director there and and again these are healthcare administration positions so we think of them more like a COO of the hospital and had oversight of acquisition and material management, um, facilities management, finance management, really seeing the healthcare system from the 30,000 foot level. And then I had an opportunity to come here where I'm now at in Gilbert, Arizona. So I'm the deputy network director and we have eight facility or healthcare systems. So hospitals plus all their clinics in Southern California, Arizona, New Mexico. And I'm very fortunate, right down the hall from me is our pharmacy benefits manager. And actually we were talking earlier today, so I'm still involved in pharmacy and some of the nuances related to pharmacy. And we have a good time talking about these different leadership challenges in pharmacy. Wow, thanks so much for sharing. It sounds like you've had a fascinating and phenomenal <laughs> journey. Um, it's and, had ups, downs, and right turns and left turns. <laughs> yeah, and it it sounds like too that you you always had an aspect of your your job role that was directly touching or interfacing with those veterans that you cared about as well. Yeah, it's one of the things I noticed early in my career, and I'd encourage everyone to think about. There's several different. Uh, assessments that you can take online, where, whether it be personality assessments. And one of the ones I did was motivators. Mm-hmm. What motivates you? What drives you? What brings energy to you at work? And my primary motivator is service. And it goes along with the idea of serving veterans. I've never heard of that one. I'll have to check it out and link it in our show notes if I could. That I've never heard of that motivators assessment, but I'm a, I'm a nerd for assessments, so I've got <laughs> to find it. That's great. I highly recommend them. And I recommend doing them throughout your career. I think we do change as we go throughout our career, just based upon our experience and other life factors, what's going on at the time. And it, I think first and foremost, we have to know ourselves before we can lead others. That's a great, great point. So Carrie, through your leadership experiences, what do you think are some misconceptions about leadership or what makes a great leader? Well, I think some of the challenge that we have is we take individuals who are highly technical competent. And what I mean by that is is they may be great clinical pharmacists. They may be great outpatient pharmacists. They may be great inpatient pharmacists. And then we put them in a a supervisory position, which is a completely different skill set. And I think that's a key misconception for folks. Um, and, And they're thinking about going into leadership or once they get in leadership, it's not the same skill set. Um, I think another misconception or or learning point would be um, it's not increased authority. You know, several people think that, well, once I become a manager, I'll have the authority to make this happen. And what you quickly find out, it's not about authority. It's about influencing people to change behavior. And that happens one on one when we're trying to change behaviors. That's not a issue a memorandum and everyone must follow the memorandum. That doesn't change behavior, and that doesn't change culture. 
And so leadership really is about being an influencer and being a leader. Um, obviously, there are times that we have to be a supervisor or manager. And, and I have to tell you, those times are not the fun times. Nobody really wants to come down hard on another person. Uh, you believe the best in people. and People do come to work to do the best that they can. And always taking a look at the system. How did the system fail? And that's one thing I see time and time again is that we put new individuals into new leadership roles and we don't match them up with a mentor. We don't put them through training, which provides true exercises where they can walk through a scenario and talk about what they would do and then receive feedback on how they might want to handle it. Um, If we do training, it's usually online and here, read this. And it's just not effective training, I think, for leadership. And that's one of the things that I've been very blessed with um, is a natural curiosity. So I sign up for everything, all kinds of training avenues. um, And kudos to folks listening to this podcast. Clearly, they're interested in becoming the best people that they can be. And so um, keep up the good work with podcasts, sharing the information and building a community. And I I think that's probably my main message is just being grateful for the community that I've been a part of and been blessed to be involved with. Yeah, that's those are some great points. And there's nothing like learning by being a part of something versus reading it, you know, in a in an email or a, a yeah. book chapter, unless you're you're faced with either some sort of simulation or a real life experience. It is certainly challenging to learn those difficult situations. Absolutely. It's those crucial conversations. You don't really know how well you'll do until you're in it. But as much as you can plan ahead or practice with someone else, I I highly recommend it. And just talk through it with someone else and say, this is what I see. And I do love the crucial conversations trainings. Um, I think they're highly valuable. And we also do some transformational coaches trainings and facilitation trainings. Ingrid Benz does some advanced facilitation that I think has been excellent. Um, That's one thing we don't do in pharmacy school, really. uh, We have a communication class, but it's more focused on how to communicate with patients. And really, we need to talk about how to communicate with other healthcare professionals and or people that you supervise and how to handle when things go wrong. Yeah, it sounds like the VA has a really great leadership development program over there. (laughs) I have been blessed. We do have uh, an executive leadership program that I went through in uh, about 2004. um, But there's several opportunities online, uh, including things like this podcast. You know, it's just about getting out there and being part of your community, whether it be local, regional, or even national. Be part of a community. Build those relationships, those safe people that you can go to, um, people that will share their stories and people that will share their mistakes. We can learn from each other's mistakes. Definitely, definitely. So, Carrie, where do you see challenges for women leaders in pharmacy, or could you share some challenges that maybe you faced yourself? Absolutely. And so I've had a couple, as I mentioned, great preceptors and mentors, and some that I've learned how I don't want to be. Um, One of my mentors was the pharmacist in charge, And um, she came to me one day and said, you just killed a patient. You sent the wrong drug down to the ED. And she let me go home that night thinking I killed someone. And I came in the next day and I was a mess. And I went to the manager and I said, what's going to happen to me? And he said, what are you talking about? And I said, well, so-and-so told me I killed a patient because I sent the wrong medication down. They're like, Carrie, you didn't kill a patient. The nurse noticed it was the wrong medication, and they sent it back and asked for the right one. Mm -hmm. And I think that's one challenge in uh, female leaders in that that, um, dog-eat-dog world, you know, trying to impress upon someone the importance of double-checking yourself. Mm -hmm. There's a a way to do it, and there's a way not to do it. Mm -hmm. At the same time, I've had some excellent mentors who just are real – kind human beings. They have the knowledge, 
but they're not so insecure that they need to flaunt their knowledge. And I think that's a challenge for female leaders in pharmacy. You know, we're, we're very driven to be technically sound and have that knowledge and then to, to prove that we have the knowledge and be able to back it up with studies and p-values and all those great things that we learned about. Uh, but it's more about being confident in yourself enough to know that you don't have to prove yourself that way that you can have a conversation with someone and ask more questions than you tell the answers to. So I had some great preceptors and mentors who would just ask me questions. And it was non-threatening. It was just, well, where did you come up with that idea? Well, what do you think about X, Y, and Z or an alternative? And we would talk through it. And I think that's really important for female leaders in pharmacy is just to be uh, emotional IQ and understand how to work with people, um, the awareness of how we present ourselves at work and how we come across. Um, I think it's sometimes difficult for women who are trying to balance that natural nurturing and still trying to make a point uh, that we need to be very detail oriented and we do need to be correct and we do need to put patient safety first. I think another uh, thing for women leaders um, is correct business attire. I see it a lot. Um, some women leaders um, uh, dress in ways that would be less modest than uh, their position. And so just being aware of that. And for goodness sakes, if we see each other doing that, we need to say something to each other. You know, talk to me, don't talk about me. Help each other. Just say, hey. Do you realize that you might want to consider a skirt that's a little less short? Or, hey, do you realize you might want to consider uh, uh, buttoning up one more button on that blouse? And then just being honest with each other. So often I see women leaders talking about other women leaders in their attire in the business place. And I think the third thing I would think about for women leaders that's a challenge is to understand that we are set apart. When you get in leadership, you can't continue to have the type of relaxed atmosphere that you may have appreciated before. And an example is I, I have a female leader in a new leadership position who went to the holiday party. Everybody's there. Everybody's enjoying it. Um, and she had a little bit to drink and... Um, you know, said some things that were inappropriate. And now, you know, she may lose her job. And so just understanding that there is a higher expectation in leadership. Well, we are held to a higher standard and we are on stage 24-7. You don't get to go to the, the grocery store um, and behave differently because you do represent your organization and leadership is 24-7. And just having that awareness of being set apart Thank you for sharing all of that great advice. I, I'm so glad you brought up the emotional intelligence um, topic. We were actually just discussing that at my um, institution today. We're thinking of incorporating emotional intelligence into our residency training. So um, it's really um, neat. Absolutely. To, I would yeah. say every residency training needs emotional intelligence and servant leadership. Mm -hmm. I think that um, that's one area, you know, because, again, in pharmacy, it's very competitive to get into pharmacy school. So it naturally draws that tendency for com competition to be technically sound. And where we usually don't focus is on the relationship-based um, interpersonal communication skills. Absolutely. So I know you mentioned a little bit about how um, women can help each other and maybe even give give each other some some nice advice sometimes. <laughs> uh, where do you see if where would you see other opportunities for women to help support each other or even grow? I think this podcast is a great example of cultivating community and how we work together to help each other share our stories. First, get comfortable in our story, and then share our story. And have the conversation. Take the time and energy to have the conversation. Uh, it's carefully cultivating that community and, and building connections, not competition. Um, I mentioned Ingrid Benz earlier as a facilitation training. And that's really where I learned a lot 
of my coaching and mentoring skills. Um, we also have a transformational coaching certification program. So I would encourage folks to look at coaching and mentoring and how to be an effective mentor or coach. Um, I like to think of more talking and less typing. Too often today we put things in text or an IM or an email if we're trying to document. And it's just really thinking about it from a human perspective. How often do we misunderstand text or, or email and how much better it would be if we would just pick up the phone and talk to each other. And I think that's a something that we've really lost in more recent years. It's really easy for me in my own time. It's convenient for me to send you an email. And in my mind, I can justify it thinking, well, it's convenient for you because you can read it when you get to it. But really what we're missing out is that community and that connection and really talking with each other. So I'd encourage more talking and less typing especially if you've gotten to the second reply on the email. By golly, if you can't clarify it in two replies, it's time to pick up the phone and stop the email. (laughs) That's a great point. I know personally, sometimes it takes me way longer to write an email than to talk with someone too. (laughs) Yeah, and it's amazing too. Um, I think sometimes I send emails and it's part of my process of thinking through what I want to say. But I could also just stop and not hit the send button and then pick up the phone and and be cohesive in what I'd like to share with that person. And and also it's more about dialogue and building dialogue. Uh, It's not about us telling the doctor what they need to do or us telling the other pharmacist or, or subordinate what they need to do. It's about having a dialogue. Absolutely. All right. I'm going to switch gears just a little bit. So, Carrie, if you can think back, uh, what would you tell your younger self about leadership or pharmacy or anything career-related? What would be the biggest piece of advice you would give your younger self? Oh, that's a great question. I love that one. Um, Don't be in such a hurry. Um, Again, pharmacy tends to attract people who are driven, right, who are task-oriented, who are details and. I think for me and my younger self, I was so driven and hungry for that next promotion, that next achievement, my BCPS. And then I wanted to move up into the next role and and really just don't be in such a hurry. You have 30 years to work. Pace yourself if you want to make it, you know, um, and just really enjoy the journey. It's not about the destination. It really is about the journey. And you'll know it's time to move on when you've absolutely learned everything you possibly can from the current situation that you're in. Don't be quick to run just because it's uncomfortable. Don't be quick to run just because you can, because you're highly skilled. Uh, For example, um, I received a call just on Friday from a facility asking me if I'd come out there to be their associate director. And I, I thought about it over the weekend, and I thought, no, I'm not done learning where I'm at. I'm not done growing where I'm at. And so really just don't be in such a hurry for the next opportunity that you miss out on enjoying the journey um, and build that stamina, you know, create anchors in your life. Remember to nurture yourself and nourish yourself. Um, so often pharmacists, and particularly the female pharmacists, we're very driven and we have lives at home and family and and just really need to think about taking care of yourself. It's okay to disengage. It's okay to turn off your phone for a day. Um, you know, I think the other thing that um, I would offer my younger self is to accentuate the positives and really focus on your strengths. And here's another one of those tests for you if you haven't done it already, the strengths identifier. Um, and I've done this twice. And each time I get a little bit different, so it's interesting. But really identifying your strengths and then playing to your strengths. And don't worry about your weaknesses. Um, For the longest time, I I had it on my list of things to do. I need to refresh my Spanish. And I finally just said to myself, Carrie, you don't need to. It's not something that you need to do right now. And that's not something that needs to be on your list because it creates a sense of... um, unfinished business or not achieving my goals. So I'm not saying don't make goals. I'm just saying don't forget to play to your strengths. 
um, and really focus on what is your expertise and not worry so much about everyone else in the race that they're running. Everyone runs their own race and we're only responsible for our race in the end. Yeah, great, great points again. I know one of my mentors told me once that their career is a marathon, not a sprint. And that's always stuck with me. <laughs> absolutely. Absolutely. And it's, that's so true. And yet we come out of school sprinting because we've been sprinting, right? It's all about uh, ranking high enough on the PCAT to get into pharmacy school, ranking high enough in class. Um, you know, it's always competition who's doing the best. And that's just sort of how we're trained. If you think about it in school, I know in one of my classes in uh, high school, they used to seat us quarterly according to our rank in the class. Wow. So it was all about competition and, and somewhat that's inbred in us. And so then how do you maintain the competition with yourself? Can you be the best you? And how do you bring the best you to work every day? And maintain that competition, but give up comparison with other people because I'll tell you the quickest way to lose your sense of peace is to start comparing to other people. You know, they talk about Facebook. Facebook is sort of your highlight reels compared to what you know is uh, going on in real life. And it's very um, damaging to some people in social media because they uh, compare themselves to what everyone else is doing. So I think it's really uh, resiliency having self-confidence, uh, pursuing your own competition with yourself, being grateful and gratitude for the opportunities given to you and optimism for the future that it is a marathon and you have what you need today to succeed today and keep running that marathon every day. Great. Again, great point. So I know we would like to keep these episodes under about 30 minutes. So, Carrie, can you tell us, what do you think is the one best way that women can help support each other in pharmacy leadership? I think the one best way women can support each other in pharmacy leadership is sharing information and communicating with each other. I think um, building that connection and that community whether they are your supervisor or not, whether they're your uh, colleague at the same office or not, if they're um, in a different manufacturing business, if they're in any different setting, it doesn't really matter what setting you're in. And I think people limit themselves. Um, you know, comfort is people who talk like us and people who can appreciate our current roles. I'd encourage people to get outside themselves you know, get outside your tent and look up at the sky and see all the stars and really recognize that we have many women leaders who are stars and what can we learn from each other and support each other through sharing information and communication and connection. Well, thank you so much, Carrie. I know I learned a lot from you today. So thank you for being on the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast. Thank you. I appreciate the opportunity, Jackie. Support for this episode comes from the audiobook Memorizing Pharmacology, a relaxed approach. With over 9,000 sales in the United States, United Kingdom, and Australia, it's the go-to resource to ease the pharmacology challenge. Available on Audible, iTunes, and Amazon.com. In print, ebook, and audiobook. Thank you for listening to the Pharmacy Leaders Podcast with your host, Tony Guerra. Be sure to share the show with the hashtag Hash Pharmacy Leaders 